Okay, Hanukkah Smech, everybody. Happy Hanukkah. Um, I don't know if uh, I didn't know that Hanukkah was an official vacation in our Smech. Maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's a Ben Asmanim today. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, the Parsha that we're reading this week is uh, Parshas Miketz. And uh, Parshas Miketz is almost always the Shabbos of Hanukkah. I say almost always. I remember that um, when I was a rabbi in Silver Spring, so there was a bar mitzvah scheduled for Parshas Miketz. And I didn't look at the calendar, so I figured, oh, no problem. I'm going to give my, uh, I'll just give a nice Shabbos Hanukkah drasha, because Miketz is always Shabbos Hanukkah. But that particular Shabbos, like once in every 200 years or so, well. Miketz is not Shabbos Hanukkah. So kind of, by the time it's like Shabbos morning, well, I realized by Friday night it wasn't Hanukkah, <laughs> but whatever. Okay. But generally speaking, Miketz is Shabbos Hanukkah. And indeed, uh, the Svarim find in the Parsha of Miketz a number of Ramazim that Miketz is connected to Hanukkah. First of all, the whole idea of Miketz, the end. So the Medrash says that right, Yosef is languishing in prison. Remember, Yosef was in prison for, for 10 years. And then he spoke to the uh, butler and said, put in a good word for me. And because that was a lack of trust in Hashem, he had to stay in prison another two years. And the whole story of Yosef coming out of prison is Miketz Shin Asayim, at the end of those two extra years, added on to the 10 years. Now he's brought before Paro, he interprets Paro's dreams, and he becomes the Mishnah Lamelech. So the Medrash says on Miketz, it uses a Pusik in Eov that has the same Lushan of Miketz, and it says, Ketz Sum Lachoshech. All darkness has an end. And this was the end of Yosef's darkness. Kates, some lechoshech, mi kates. And that's what Hanukkah is about. The light pierces the darkness. It is the end of the darkness. You know, Maral points out a beautiful thing that uh, Hanukkah is approximately, it's not always the exact date, uh, during the winter solstice. Now, the winter solstice is the longest night of the year, the shortest amount of daylight. And even after the winter solstice, there is still more darkness than light, but gradually the darkness is decreasing. But you don't think it's decreasing because it's still more dark than light. So the morale says, Hanukkah comes at the low point when the darkness is greatest, but precisely at that lower point, the light is beginning to come a little bit at a time. That's Kate sum lechoshech. There is an end for darkness that we have to be aware of. But also, it's very interesting that what is the halacha of where you light Hanukkah candles? So you'll notice, obviously, if you live in Eretz Israel, you notice there are two minhagim. The original halacha of the Gemara is you're supposed to light the menorah outside in the street, adjacent to your doorway. And the concept would be the mezuzah would be to the right of the doorway as you enter. And the Ner Hanukkah is to be to the left of the doorway, so you're surrounded by mitzvos, And uh, that's the halacha, that you light tefach within one fist, samuch lepesach, adjacent to the doorway. And the reason is because we want to have persume nisa. We want to publicize the miracle to the people that walk by in the street, that they should see the candles of Hanukkah, and they should remember Hashem's miracles. The Gemara then says, I'm going to explain the Machlokas, that at some point it became a sakana to light your candles outside. Now, let's ask our question, why would it be a sakana? If anything, the fire hazard might be greater inside than outside. Why was it a sakana to light your candles outside? So the simple reason is that when Eretz Yisrael was ruled by the Romans, Hanukkah was a bit of a dangerous holiday to celebrate publicly, right? Because some Roman guy walks by and says, hey, why are you lighting candles? Oh, we are commemorating the overthrow of foreign oppression over the land of Israel. Hmm, that sounds like a call for revolution. So as a result, Chazal's enacted, when it became a sakana to light outside, we bring our candles inside. Now, the big machlokas about Minhagim today is... How do you, what do you do when it's no longer dangerous to light outside? Do we say that once they change the halacha from outside to inside, 
that becomes permanent. And therefore, even when there's no sakana, you light inside. And that is why many people do light inside, even in Yerushalayim. Or do we say, no, the halacha was to light outside. Elamai, when it was a sakana, we didn't do it. We do it inside. But when there's no longer a sakana, you have to go back to the original takana of the Gemara that says you should light outside. That's why you have two minhagim, meaning the critical question becomes, when the Gemara says, bishas ha-sakana, they were misakin, you light it inside, is that an ad hoc temporary thing for a temporary situation? Or was that a permanent orientation of the mitzvah? Now, Kabbalistically, there's actually even a deeper explanation, and that is, the idea is that when non-Jews attack Judaism, when non-Jews look at Jews and say, oh, you're not good, that's actually because we're not living up to the way we should live. So the pshat is, when it became a sakana to be mefarsam Hashem's nase, that must be a chisarin within us. So we bring the neiros inside that we should grow in our pursume nisa, and then we're able to bring it out again. Okay, but be it as it may, uh, as, as you see, uh, the predominant minog in Yerushalayim, although there are many exceptions, is that people do light outside. Machlok is exactly uh, where do you light outside if you have, a, have an apartment building, a lot of people, you know, do you one on top of the other or, or whatever. So some want to say there's a remez to this mitzvah in Parsha Smiketz. Very interesting remez. The Pasuk says, Vayhi Miketz, you know, Sayim Yamim, it was at the end of two years that Paro had a dream and the Sar HaMashkim, the butler, remembered that Yosef was in prison and Yosef can interpret dreams. So let's look at the word Shinasayim and make it a Rashi Teva, make it an acronym. Shinasayim. The Shin is a sin. Samo, to the left. Ner, a candle. Tadlik, you should light. Yamin, to the right. Mizusa is the Mizusa. You hear Shinasayim. Samo, Ner, Tadlik, Yamin, Mizusa. So, that's an amazing thing, that the remez, that mezuzah to the right and Hanukkah to the left is built into the word shenosayim. So now, let's think about this halacha a little bit. What is the concept that the mezuzah is to the right of my doorway and their Hanukkah is to the left of my doorway? It's interesting, if we look at the Mishkan, or the Beis HaMikdash for that matter, each of the things of the Beis HaMikdash has a very deep spiritual and symbolic value. But there are actually two symbols for the Torah. The Torah is so important. There are two different symbols for the Kayach of the Torah in the Mishkan or in the Beis HaMikdash. The most obvious, of course, is the Aron HaKodesh that's in the Kodesh HaKodeshim. And in the Aron HaKodesh, in the Kodesh HaKodeshim, are the Luchais, the tablets in which Hashem inscribed the Aseris Hadibros. And by the way, in the Aran are not only the second Luchos that were intact, but even the fragments of the first Luchos that Moshe Rabbeinu smashed are in the Aran. And the Gemara has a beautiful teaching. The Gemara says like this. The Gemara says, how do we know that if you had a great Talmud Chacham who unfortunately became ill, dementia, Alzheimer's, for God is learning. How do you know you must still honor a great Talmud Chacham, even if all of his learning was forgotten? Beautifully. Because even the broken luchos have a place of honor in the Aron HaKodesh. Right? So that's a source about how we deal with the elderly, how do we deal with people that are are impaired because they still have that greatness. You have to understand that the greatness of Torah is not just what's in your brain. The Torah permeates your cells. So even if the brain doesn't retain all the information, the Torah itself remains. Right? A person might be senile, a person might have dementia, a person might not remember anything, but the Torah they learn is still part of their neshama. Um, and I remember just not, not about Torah per se, but, I, but this, this is actually often very true about people 
who have Alzheimer's or people who have dementia, that they don't remember anything, but their basic goodness or not goodness of their personalities are still there. You know, I had uh, an aunt, not alive anymore, and uh, in her last uh, years she had the dementia and uh, her um, granddaughter was taking care of her. So I remember uh, out of the blue, I, I got a call from the granddaughter that she would like to come with her aunt for Rosh Hashanah. So, you know, she came with her aunt, I mean, I mean with her grandmother, my aunt, for Rosh Hashanah, and my aunt didn't, didn't seem to recognize me. She didn't even know who I was. But she was always such a nice, kind, considerate person that even though she didn't know who I was, you know, that niceness, that beauty, beauty of character still came through. Although it is interesting, I mean, a, I, mean I don't want to digress too much about this, that even people with dementia have moments of recognition. It's very, uh, there were moments in which she did know who I was and she lit up with excitement and then, you know, it goes away. But even when that goes away, the goodness of a person's mito still remain. And this is why the Gemara says that even when a Talmud Chacham has forgotten his learning, you still honor him because the Torah still made him who he was. Okay. So there are two symbols, again, going back. So in the base of Mikdash, the Aron HaKodesh and the Luchos is symbol number one. But there's another symbol about the Torah, and that's the menorah. The menorah is a symbol of the Torah. The menorah represents the light of Hashem. Torah is called light. So here's the question. Why do we have two symbols for the Torah? Aron HaKodesh and menorah. Why do you have two symbols representing the same thing? And the answer is, they do not represent the same thing. The Aron HaKodesh represents the written Torah, and the menorah represents the oral Torah. One simon is Torah Shebichsav, and one simon is Torah Shebaal But doesn't water represent Torah? Water is another symbol that represents Torah, but, but I'm talking about in the, in the Beis HaMikdash. Oh, what, yeah. what are the tangible symbols in the Beis HaMikdash that represents Torah? The answer is the Aron HaKodesh with the Luchos and the Menorah. Now, the symbolism is not so difficult to discern. Obviously, the Aron HaKodesh contains the Luchos. The Luchos are the written words that God said to inscribe on the Luchos. So that represents the Torah Shebich Now, the Torah Shebich is unchangeable. The Torah Shebich quite literally, is etched in stone. The Torah Shebich is not affected by human creativity or input. These are God's words. That's it. On the other hand, the Torah Shebich standing alone is obscure. It's secret. We really don't understand what it means. That's why... The luchais that represent Torah Shebichsav are concealed in an aron, and the aron itself is concealed in the Holy of Holies, which is inaccessible, because the remez is Torah Shebichsav, without the oral tradition, is obscure, it's mysterious, it's beyond our comprehension. So that represents Torah Shebichsav. The menorah, the light of Torah, primarily represents Torah Shabalpeh, the oral interpretations of the sages, their discussions. Because here's the thing. Unlike the Luchais that come from God, the Menorah has to be lit by man. So that represents <coughs> the human perspective. The Menorah also, if you look at a flame, even in our Hanukkah candles, if you look closely, you'll see different colors, different nuances. Flames move up and down. There is orange, and there is yellow, and there is a white, and there's blue. Right? Blue is right in the middle of the flame. That represents the idea that each chacham brings different perspectives, different understandings, different svaras. I say this almost every week in one way or the other, so forgive me for repeating it. Torah Shabal Peh is not just a mechanical transmission of what God told Moshe. Rather, God told Moshe fundamental principles, but the chachamim of every generation have to work them out and apply it. So Torah Shabal Peh is not static. Torah Shabal Peh is dynamic. It is creative. 
It is interactive. It is a partnership with Hashem. It's not simply Hashem telling us what to do, but Hashem giving us the response, giving us, meaning the Chachamim, the responsibility to work out the implications. That's the menorah. The flames of a menorah, unlike the luchos that are static, I could look at the luchos for 100 years, they're not going to change shape. The luchos is final. That's what it is. The flames of the menorah are ever-changing. So it turns out that in the Beis HaMikdash, we have two different symbols of Torah. We have the Luchais in the Aran HaKadosh, that is the Teresh HaBichsav, and we have the Menaira, which whose dancing lights and different colors and hues and nuances represent Torah Shabal Pet. Now, remember this. The Torah Shabal is in the Holy of Holies because it's inaccessible. We really don't understand what it means. The Menaira is out where people can see it. Although it's in the Beis HaMikdash, per se, because once we have Torah Shabal Pet, we're able to understand what Torah Shabal is. Okay, so that's the idea in the Beis HaMikdash. Now, here is an interesting point. Every Jewish home Every Jewish home is potentially a base on mikdash to God. In fact, uh, the Ramban points out an interesting thing. When little Rivka, who was only three years old, according to Rashi, was brought to Yitzchak. So it says, Yitzchak brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and she became his wife and he loved her. And Rashi says, there were three miracles that were connected to Sarah's tent, that when Sarah died, those miracles stopped, even though Avram was still alive. And when Rivka came in, those three miracles came back. I'm sure, I'm sure you've learned this, Rashi. And what are the three miracles? There was a blessing in her dough when she would make bread. You would just eat a little bit of that bread and it sustained you and it nourished you for a long time. Her candle that she lit in honor of Shabbos burnt the whole week. And there was a cloud of glory over her tent that symbolized the divine presence. And when Sarah died, even though Avram was so great, all of those miracles left. And only when Rivka came in did those miracles return? Now, this is what Rashi brings. The Ramban adds an interesting connection, connective point. The Ramban points out that the three miracles of Sarah's tent correspond to three miracles in the Mishkan that are actually parallel to that. Because a blessing in the dough, where did you <coughs> see that? There was the showbread. Every Friday, 12 chalos were baked. And on Shabbos, they were put on a golden table. And they would not be eaten till next Shabbos when they would be replaced by new chalos. This is called lechem hapanim. And the bread that would be eaten more than one week after it was put on the table was still warm and fresh. So you see there was a blessing in the dough. The ner, the blessing in the candle, when they would light the menorah every day, there was always a ner tamid. One candle didn't go out. Even before Hanukkah, one candle didn't go out. And a cloud of glory was over the Mishkan. In other words, what is the Ramban telling me? That the three miracles of the Mishkan correspond to the three miracles of the tent of Sarah Imenu. What is the implication of that? The tent of Sarah is the prototype of a Jewish home. In other words... The Jewish home is the Beis HaMikdash, is the Beis HaMikdash. The miracles of the temple can be replicated in the Jewish home. It's an old cliche that people have that the most important institution in Judaism is not the shul and it's not the yeshiva, but it's the home. It's the relationship of husband and wife and parents and children. That is why, according to Halacha, when you start a Jewish community, the very first institution you have to build before you build a shul is you have to build a mikvah 
because a mikvah is necessary to allow husband and wife mm -hmm. to function as a married couple. That's the most important thing. Nothing is as important as the relationship of husband and wife. So Mimela, here's the thing. If in the Beis HaMikdash or Mishkan, we need a symbol of both the written Torah and the oral Torah, a Jewish home also needs that symbolism. So here's the thing. The mezuzah <coughs> is a symbol of the written Torah. Why? Because what's in a mezuzah? The parshas of Shema, right? The words in the mezuzah are from the written Torah. The symbol of the oral Torah is the menaira of Ner Hanukkah. In other words, just, in other words, the point basically is the same way in the Mishkan you have the Luchais as symbol of written Torah and menorah as symbol of oral Torah, so to Hanukkah where you're dedicating your own Beis HaMikdash in your home, you have the mezuzah that's a symbol of the written Torah and it's in a case, just like the, the Luchos are in a case, right? And the menorah is your Torah Shabbal Peh, right? The colors, the flames, the hues, the different dancing up and down of the flames is the oral Torah. So in a sense, on Hanukkah, the word Hanukkah means dedication, right? You're dedicating. On Hanukkah, I am, I am not just commemorating the dedication of the second temple. I am dedicating my home to be a Beis HaMikdash. So therefore I bring in the symbol of Torah Shabachsav and Torah Shabalpeh. Okay, you see this, the association here. So now with this, let's try to understand though, why does the mezuzah go on the right and the Ner Hanukkah go on the left? So with apologies to anyone that's a lefty, again, I apologize, but generally speaking, we look at the right as the dominant, stronger hand. For most people, it happens to be. That's why you Yubedavka put tefillin on your weaker hand. So people who are righties put their tefillin on their left hand. People who are lefties put their tefillin on their right hand. Right? Because tefillin is an unusual feature that you put it on your weaker hand. By the way, tefillin itself is a very, very interesting... I mean, I don't want to get into tefillin. It's not, not our topic. But uh, how do you define uh, what is your dominant hand? Because sometimes you may have a dominant writing hand, but you may have a stronger throwing hand, right? So let's assume that in the olden days, maybe not, not so much today, but in the olden days, parents would often uh, force children not to be lefties. So if you were naturally favoring the left, in fact, the word, <laughs> in fact, a lot of superstitions about this. The word sinister comes from the Latin for a lefty. It was considered to be like devil, sinister, right? So we have to, I, the, 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 literally, look up a dictionary. It's like, sinister means originally left-handed, but it became sinister, like sin and, and the like. So often parents would like force a child to favor the right by writing, but the child would still throw things uh, with the left and the like. So for tefillin, what do you look at? Do you look at the stronger hand or do you look at the writing hand? So the truth is, uh, ask a rabbi if it comes up, uh, but by tefillin, we'd look at writing. So if I write with my right, I put tefillin on my left, even if I throw with my left. Okay, with the, the different shots. Okay. So the question is, going with this stereotype, which is the common stereotype, that right represents dominance. So apparently, we put the mezuzah to the right because the written Torah has to be dominant over the oral Torah. But what does that mean? Actually, halakhically, that's not emes. Halakhically, the oral Torah explains the... I can't look at the written Torah and say, oh, the Torah says an eye for an eye. No, Chazal say that means compensation, right? So what do we mean that the written Torah is dominant? So let me explain this. The written Torah represents God's command. The oral Torah represents the human interpretation, elaboration, application. There is no room for creativity and innovation in the written Torah. The words are what they are. The creativity and innovation becomes activated, so to speak, in the oral Torah. Why we argue, we discuss, we debate. Right? Rashi, Tosos, Rambam, Ramban, all of the different opinions. 
that comes up because in the, within the framework of the oral Torah, we debate and we, we argue and we come with different positions. Now, creativity is a wonderful thing. But creativity must be rooted in submission to the will of God. When creativity becomes a freewheeling exercise in coming up with whatever I think is right, then it becomes narcissistic. It becomes egotistical. It is no longer looking at what God wants. It's looking at what I want and what I like. So here's the concept. The concept is imagine a kite. I don't know if you ever flew kites as kids or maybe you fly kites even now. Uh, right? So a kite can go real, 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 real high. But somebody has to either be holding it or tying it to a pole or something. Because if the, if the kite is not rooted on earth, it just flies off into the stratosphere and it gets lost. So on one hand, you want to be like a kite. You want to be able to fly. You want to be able to be creative. You want to be able to be innovative. You want to be able to have original thoughts. That's a human need. And that's a good need. And Hashem wants you to be a person of creativity and a person of thoughtfulness and a person of deep understanding. But you can't be a kite that simply flies into the sky without being tied down. You have to be tied down <coughs> to the ruts and Hashem. So therefore, if you want to have a menorah that represents creativity, it has to be subordinated to the words of Hashem in the Torah Shebech And that's why the mezuzah is to the right, because that represents the fixed will of God. And when your mezuzah is to the right, you can have your Ner Hanukkah, which is creativity, innovation, to the left. Otherwise, it just becomes narcissistic. You're just figuring out what's good for you. Like I mentioned before, uh, there was a professor at Harvard who wrote a book about religion. Uh, not, not a Jewish book, just a book about religion in America. So he interviewed a lot of people. So one of the people he interviewed was a nurse whose name was Sheila. And Sheila said, like many people say, that she does believe in God, but she does not believe in organized religion. So she says she invented her own religion, way of connecting to God. She calls it Sheilaism. And Sheila says, I relate to God, Sheilaism. So a, a rabbi was once talking about this book, and a rabbi commented, you know, it's lucky her name wasn't Judy. Because if her name would be Judy, she would say, oh, she has a religion called Judaism. Now, the truth of the matter is, a lot of people do have a religion called Judaism. People say, hey, I'm Jewish, and this is what I believe, so that's Judaism. People, like, make up their own things. Now, the issue that I'm, I'm suggesting is a complicated issue, and that is, on some level, we are supposed to be creative. We are supposed to be independent. We are supposed to be thinking about the unique and special way I serve Hashem. We're supposed to be kites that are flying in the air. But we have to be rooted in God's will. We can't just be freewheeling and make everything up. And that, I think, is the symbolism of if you want to have your menorah which represents creativity and innovation and deeper understanding. That's a wonderful thing. But it always has to be tough fell, secondary to the will of Hashem as expressed in the words of the Torah itself. And that's why the mezuzah, which is Torah Shebech is to the right. And that is why the Ner Hanukkah, which is Torah Shebaal Peh, is to the left, yeah. What was it? I'm sorry, is this for me or for you? Oh, oh, no. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. I was just wondering, I mean, there's a, uh, like, in general, Judaism, um, like, say, a uh, precedent of the right over the left, right? So is there a preference, maybe, like, in terms of the mezuzah, like, to be... Well, well there, there's Kabbalistically, there's another idea here, too, which is related. And that is in Kabbalah, the right represents chesed, the power of loving kindness. 
the left represents the powers of judgment and punishment. So the right is dominant because we hope and we pray that God's dominant connection to us will be one of chesed rather than gevura. In fact, there's a famous, one of the most famous Mamari Chazal about, about raising children. It says, when you raise a child, yamin mekarevet, your right hand should draw him near with affection. Your left hand should push him away. Now, this is a brilliant, brilliant teaching because what it's saying is, in raising a child, there are two things you have to have. You have to show love and affection and care, but you also have to have discipline and boundaries. If you let a child do whatever he wants, he will never grow up to be a responsible person. So you can't just have love without discipline. There has to be discipline. But what a Chazal is saying is, the love should come from the right hand. The stronger hand should be love. The discipline should be weaker. That's very important. You need discipline, but discipline should not be the dominant feature of the relationship. The dominant feature of the relationship should be love. Now, Rasim Chavasman used to add a nice little shtickle. He says, what is it? Uh, the Lashon of the Gemara is, the right hand should draw near and the left hand should push out. Now, imagine a child standing in front of me who's turned his back on me. He rejects me. He wants nothing to do with me. So I put my two hands on his shoulder. I pull with my right and I push with my left. What do I get? The child turns around. <laughs> that's quite literally. That's how you turn him around. You turn him around by a uh, pull with the right and a push with the left, and that's going to turn him around. I'm sorry, did you want to say? Uh, yeah, you talk about that. You mentioned that one should find uh, a unique way in which they serve Hashem Bet. Uh, um, let's understand that the, in general, the optimal, most accepted way to serve Hashem is through the Mude Torah. So is, is, that a, is, that a, is there a contradiction or a misunderstanding? No, no, there's not a contradiction here. In other words, the, here's the following. Um, certainly, there's a certain minimal thing that we all have to do. I mean, in order to serve God properly, God gave us an instruction for life, an instruction manual for life. That is Torah and mitzvot. And we have to learn the Torah and we have to do mitzvot. And there's no question, you can't just invent your own best way of serving God that doesn't involve Torah and mitzvot. But what I'm suggesting is that within the framework of Torah and mitzvot, you then develop your own specialties and subspecialties as to what mitzvah will be my, you know, my great accomplishment. Uh, some people, for example, uh, might feel a special attraction towards visiting the sick or organizing stucca funds or learning certain parts of the Torah. So it's not a contradiction. It is a, con it is a tension, to be sure. You know, listen, to be frank, uh, being an Orthodox Jew involves a tremendous amount of conformity. I mean, there's no question about it. You know, uh, like everybody got to do the same stuff. Uh, you know, we got to keep Shabbos, we got to keep kosher, right? So we're not a, a commune, a hippie commune where, you know, do your own thing, march to your own drummer. So there's a great deal of conformity. But, 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 within the conformity, Hashem also wants you to develop as an individual. If you have artistic talents, writing talents, musical talents, right? Even here in Arsameach, right? Rabbi Sinclair has his, um, has his orchestra, I'm not sure if they're performing in Hanukkah or not. Did they? Uh, they did already? Okay, okay. Right? Now, those things are good, really. Those things are, you know, people might say, oh, okay, or Shemeh, Bali so we, we got to let them do this stuff. It, it's, 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 it's more than that. There's something deeper here. It's not just, you know, we got to let people do that because they're not ready to live by a higher standard. That's not how I would put it. I would say it's part of God's plan that we use our talents and we use our abilities in good ways to serve him. Going beyond building on Torah and mitzvahs. So, God forbid, this does not mean to replace the Torah and the mitzvahs. But this means looking at the Torah and the mitzvahs as a foundation to then express your creativity and your ability as well. And that's a little bit of a challenge because, you know, um, in a way, it's always easier to go to the extremes. Either 
I'm just a conformist. I'm just like a marsh, and I'm just like a robot who robotically goes through the motions. Or I'm a free wheeler. I do whatever I want. I have Judaism, right? Whatever it is. So those are extremes. <coughs> but the extremes are not, neither extreme is good, right? You've got to kind of build on this foundation and then find your own unique way of serving, serving a Kodesh Baruch. So that's the meaning. The Menaira is the creativity of life but it has to be rooted in the mitzvahs of the Torah, not to be a freewheeling creativity, which again becomes narcissistic. A person, a person who says, you know, I serve God by doing whatever makes me feel happy. You know, you're not serving God. I mean, you're serving you, right? That's narcissism in which uh, everything is connected to how it makes me feel. Now, this has some interesting re practical repercussions. Because sometimes people say, Oh, I can't learn today because I'm not inspired. I can't daven today because I just don't feel. <laughs> now, now, of course, you know, we want to feel. But sometimes the answer is, okay. Somebody went to the Chavitz Chaim and says, I don't have enthusiasm when I learn Torah. So the Chavitz Chaim says, well, I guess you have to learn without enthusiasm for a while. Meaning, uh, we're not always going to be inspired. I mean... Hopefully, we pray that maybe someday we'll reach that level. But you know, uh, the truth is, you know, you don't you don't have that level twenty four seven. But part of being an Eved Hashem is, I stay the course. Meaning, yeah, Bezras Hashem, there are going to be moments of inspiration, moments of simcha, moments of really, really being connected. But I'm not going to condition my avoda on having that connection. Because things come and go. Emotions ebb and flow. They rise and fall. I can't expect that every moment will be the peak of things. But in Ebed Hashem says, I'm going to do the job anyway. In fact, that's uh, that great sign they put up. They take it down. About the, uh, it was a secular sign. The 10 things you don't have to have education for. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, a real good, uh, that's a real good sign. You know, just kind of do it. You know, do the right thing. You know, get up. You know, show up. <laughs> you, know, uh, you don't have to always be in the height. Of, now, again, I, I don't mean to say that in the long run, Judaism should be boring or hard. You know, uh, obviously, as we grow in Avaita, we want there to be enthusiasm and simcha. But you got to know that even if I don't feel it at that particular moment, I still go ahead and I do it. And the truth is, even from a secular standpoint, that is what is called maturity. I mean, you know, a mature person understands that I have responsibilities in the world. And I'm going to keep... Yeah, I mean, listen, sometimes parents uh, are sick of uh, dealing with their kids. <laughs> right? I come home after a long day of work. And they, right? So, you know, I'd rather not be a parent today, you know, go out... You know, <laughs> go out into the street, you know. You know, you, you got to do what you got to do, right? And that's in Yiddishkeit as well. You got to do what you got to do. So it is very important to kind of recognize that inspiration is wonderful and it's something we should strive for and we should try to get into feelings of inspiration and joy, but it's not a deal breaker. You know, even when I don't have those feelings all the time, I go ahead and I do what I need to do, right? That's a very important idea, yeah. I just thought, uh, I was just thinking about the mashal of chesed and glura, yeah. and left and right for the Hanukkah and the, and the um, mezuzah. I was thinking, number one, that the Hanukkah is, is um, in the darkest time of the year, that's glura. Um, also, thing, and that's connected, chesed, uh, which is the, or the, the giving of the Torah, uh, right, was it was a pure act of chesed, and then it similarly, chesed, uh, 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 the, while the oral, uh, sorry, while the written Torah was chesed, maybe we, uh, this is really where my question comes in, maybe we could view the oral Torah, the fact that some of it was left off, uh, left for us to kind of need to work on and figure out, that that could be an act of glory, like, um, similar to a parent letting go of their children. Yep, you know, that's very true. Us, but that, that's a very, very excellent point. In fact, there is in some svarim the idea that the oral law bichlal is gevura because Hashem is withholding something. So we go ahead. Because gevura doesn't mean punishment. People mi misunderstand that. Gevura means Hashem is withholding something. Zayin HaChinami, Torah Shabal Peh, is an act of gevura, so we need to work to kind of figure it, uh, figure it out. That, that's, that's very true. 
Now, let me just stand with one, uh, I think, one interesting thought from the Mekubalim. That is, you know, Hashem didn't create the sun until the fourth day of creation. So for day one, day two, and day three, there were 12 hours of light. 12 hours, that's 36 hours. But there was no sun. So what generated the light for the first 36 hours of creation? It was light and darkness, right? So the light was the light of the Shekhinah. For the first 36 hours of creation, I'm sorry, the first 36 hours of light, which means the first three days of creation, the light was the light of the Shekhinah. But then, starting with the creation of the sun on the fourth day, Hashem concealed this light, which will not be available until Mashiach comes. And this is called the Or Haganuz, the concealed light of 36 hours. Now, how many Hanukkah candles do we light if you don't count the Shamash? Don't count the Shamash. We, we light 36 candles on Hanukkah. You know, one if you just add up the numbers. Right? Huh? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's 44 with the Shamash. Uh, that's why every package, right? You see, every package of Hanukkah candles is 44 candles because that's, uh, you know, that's uh, 36 plus 8 uh, Shamases. But let's just go with the 36. So it's brought down in Kabbalah that the 36 candles of Hanukkah return to the world the 36 hours of the hidden light of the Shekhinah that enlightened the world for 36 hours. That's why there is such a concept of sitting and gazing at the Hanukkah candles. Now, granted, there are certain restrictions. You're not allowed to read by them. That's why you have a shamish or other light that you shouldn't get benefit from the light. But gazing at the light is said to be a very, very powerful thing because you're essentially incorporating within you the light of the Shekhinah, the light of the Divine Presence, the Or, the Or Hagonos, the hidden light. And that, that, that is what so, is so significant about the Neiros of, of Hanukkah. And as I said at the very beginning, uh, Hanukkah, which means dedication, is not only a commemoration of the dedication of the Beis HaMikdash, but my own Beis HaMikdash, right? We, we have the famous words of the Sefer Charedim, uh, Bilvavi Mishkon Evnech. I build in my heart a tabernacle of Hashem. Right, also famous, a very, very fine books for him in Hebrew and in English, written by Rev. Uh, Isomer Schwartz. I'm sure you've come across it. Bilvavi Mishkan. I mean, it's, it's based on those words from the Sefer Charedim. In my heart, I build a Mishkan. So here's the thing. When we talk about Hanukkah as a dedication of the Mishkan, or the Beis HaMikdash, it also means a dedication of the Beis HaMikdash in my heart. I'm dedicating my heart to the Mishkan by incorporating the hidden light of, of Hanukkah. So, oh, oh I, I, finally, finally, I have to say that of all of the days of Hanukkah, interestingly enough, it's number five that's considered to be the holiest night day of Hanukkah. That's tonight, right? Tonight, tomorrow, is Ner Chamishi. In Hasidus, it's the fifth night that is the holiest night of Hanukkah. Now, why is that so? What, what is so special about the fifth night? So a few people, uh, there are a few, a few different views. One opinion is, you know the famous Machlokas, Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel? How do you light Hanukkah candles? Beit Shammai says, go with eight and go down. And Beit Hillel says, go with one and go up. Well, the halacha is like Beit Hillel, but the fifth night is when Beit Hillel surpasses Beit Shammai. Meaning Beis Shammai has more candles every night until the fifth. Now since Beis Hillel represents Chesed and Beis Shammai represents Din, so the fifth night is when the Chesed beats out the Din. You see, you understand the numerical calculation. Because <coughs> according to Beis Shammai, it's eight, seven, six, five. According to Beis Hillel, it's one, two, three, four. So the Din is stronger. But on the fifth... Beis Hillel becomes five, Beis Shammai becomes four. So this is Hisgabrus HaChasadim. The Chasadim overpowers. That's one idea. There's another idea for the fifth night of Hanukkah. 
uh, and that is, under the Jewish calendar, it is the only night of Hanukkah that can never be on Shabbos, Friday night. The, 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 in other words, every other night, Hanukkah, the first night of Hanukkah can be Shabbos, the second night, the third night, the fourth night, the sixth night, the seventh night, the eighth night, all of those days could be Friday night. But because of the configuration of the calendar, the fifth night of Hanukkah can never be on Shabbos. So why is that important? That's, that almost sounds like a negative. He says, no, because the light is so powerful that it doesn't need a Shabbos to augment it or bolster it. In other words, if it doesn't need a tikkun of Shabbos, the kayach of the Ner Chamishi is extraordinarily great. This is a big thing in Chabad, but other Hasidists as well, but, but Ner Chamishi. If you look around, you can look up, uh, just Google, Ner Chamishi, and you'll get Hasidish stories about uh, the special night. So this night especially is a, a special time for uh, Hanukkah. So anyway, I want to wish you all a Hanukkah Sameach, and uh, you. may uh, your neshamas absorb the hidden light that is in the neighbors. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.